Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and today we have a wonderful, wonderful program, specifically for those, um, I hate to use the word seniors, but those uh, who have lived a long and full life and still have life in them. Let's just put it that way. And here to help us with some great information is our special guest, Meryl Bailey. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to brag on you a little bit. She's a managing partner of Your Caring Law Firm. She's a graduate of Barry University School of Law, um, also from University of Central Florida. You're just smart. You know what you're doing. <laughs> or we're, persistent. Or perhaps. persistent, right. Um, we're so glad you're here. And, and today... I know, you know, here, especially here in the Central Florida area, the, the demographic for our seniors, um, you know, is quite large. And so I don't think that generation thought too much about planning for the future uh, and estate planning in particular what, that we're going to talk about. So I want you to explain, if you would, for the guests and for me, you can refresh me, what is estate planning and, and why is it so important, particularly for seniors? Estate planning... You know when you're in the movies and they say, I have to get my affairs in order? Yes. That's pretty much okay. what estate planning is. Okay. So you are choosing to take action now while you have capacity to name three different things. You are naming someone in writing in a legal document who can help you if you're alive but can't help yourself, so if you became incapacitated, okay. who will help you with your financial affairs, with your medical care decisions, you're naming that person. In addition, you're naming who will handle your affairs and the transfer of your assets after you die. And most importantly, you are naming who will inherit your assets after you die. Because if you don't take action, the state of Florida has a plan for you, and the state of Florida will name who is going to take, make decisions for you if you're incapacitated. And the state of Florida is going to say who's going to handle your affairs after you die. And the state of Florida is going to say who inherits your wealth. And most people don't really want the state of Florida to do that. <laughs> uh, obviously, and, and I mean, aside from what you've earned and what you've saved, there are sentimental items that, you know, you, you want kept within the family and, uh, or property that you want to keep within the family. So, yeah, to let someone else decide that, that would be motivation enough for me to put something together. As you're talking, I'm thinking, well, isn't that a will? Is there a difference between estate planning and a will or are there additional steps? A will is a component of an estate plan. Okay. So an estate plan consists of making several decisions and then naming different people in different documents. And then I also know um, there, there are trusts. And I know there, there are, is a difference between a trust and a will, if you will. Yes. There's three different ways that assets transfer title after you die. So there's a hierarchy to them. So the first hierarchy of assets is what I call operation of law. Mm -hmm. And those are assets that magically, after death, belong to someone else. So if you own something jointly with someone else with rights of survivorship, okay. the other person automatically gets it. So if you're married and you own something with your spouse, spouse automatically inherits the moment you die. Homestead in Florida also is an operation of law asset. So the first thing we look at is what transferred title automatically. Second, there are contract assets, and that's anything that has a beneficiary designation form. So think life insurance, uh, retirement plans, 401ks, IRAs, right. payable on death accounts. You, it's a contract between you and the, the provider, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to pay this premium, I'm going to pay this fee each year, and you bank or you insurance company promise that when I die, you'll pay the money over to this third party. That's a contract. Only after you've exhausted the operation of law and contract assets do you even get to your will or your trust. So if your, your will or your trust could say that you were leaving all your wealth to a charity, to the, the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee, uh -huh. but if all of your assets were operation of law and contract, the elephants are going to starve. Yeah. We never got to the will. Right. But if a, when you get down to the will and trust level, the difference between them is, is primarily two different ways. Privacy... A will goes through the probate court and is public record. Right. And a trust is private. And second, the path that it takes to get your assets. You end up in the same place, but the path that you take is a little different. So if I were to use an analogy, yes. if you were to buy, if you assume that a will or a trust was a car, if you bought a will, you are buying a car that is going to sit in your garage with no tires on it and you don't get the keys. Okay. And the day you die, you're saying who you want to have the keys, and that person takes the keys and has to go to the probate court to buy the tires for the car. Gotcha. And they have to get approval from the court to drive the car, but the car has to go where you want it to say. If you buy a trust and it's a car, you get the keys now, you get to drive it, it has tires, 
And when you die, you're naming who gets the keys next, and the car is full of gas, and it's got tires, and that person just keeps driving. Wow, yes. That is a wonderful analogy. Um, and I think a lot of people just think, oh, my will. I need to do a will. And they don't think beyond that. Um, I also know, you know, some of there are documents that are necessary and need to be put in order. I mean, if you're married, you're, you said your spouse automatically inherits joint own things? Um, Generally, yes. Home, property, that type yeah. of stuff. Okay. Um, now, if, if the person, do you have to designate it to your spouse? Let's say your spouse uh -huh. is already deceased. No, you can, you can choose if you take action. Yes. You, will, you can name anybody you want. You can include charities. You can name friends. You can name family. You can leave as much as you want or as little as much as little as you want to anyone you choose. But if you do not take affirmative action, the state of Florida says who inherits. It doesn't include your church. It doesn't include charities. It's right. generally family. OK, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I'm sure you've worked with families helping to put together you know, these type of things. In your experience, um, is it something that a, a, a senior you know, will do on their own typically, or is it something that you know, that child they may be living with or that looks in on them has to kind of bring up. I mean, have you found any one or the other? You know, Nick, what I've found is that most seniors don't want to be a burden. Yeah. And so they want to do the right thing. They might not know what that takes. And it can be a little scary to find a lawyer and go to a lawyer. Right. But you have to do something if you... Doing nothing is a choice to right. let the state control. Right. So you have to take affirmative action. The more... The earlier you take it and the more you think it through, the easier it will be and the less burden you'll be for your children. And I'm just thinking, too, as someone hearing us today or they're in the process uh, of putting together the information and making those decisions so that someone can create the will or the trust or the estate, um, what what are some of the things they should be thinking of that are the you know the basics? I know you know life insurance policies that they g gather together to make it uh, an easier thing to do once they reach the attorney stage. Well, the attorney's going to help them, yeah. of course, and and let them know what they need to think through. But what what I want them to think is what's important to them. Who do they love? What what values do they want to pass along? How do they want to do that? How much is enough? Right. You know, you don't want to ruin your grandchildren. You want to leave yeah. them enough that they're that they're not hungry or out in the cold, but not so comfortable that they never work right. or don't go to school. Right. So it's a you have to think that all through. That's excellent, and and to help process what would be best. And uh, yeah. a lot of us don't think that way. So having someone you know is very beneficial. If you had to pick um, one document as a senior. If you had just one document that a senior should absolutely have, what would that be? Everyone in the state of Florida, age 18 and above, should have a general durable power of attorney. If you have one document, it's the general durable power of attorney. It is the document in which you name someone to step in your shoes and be you legally. It lives with you and it dies with you, so this person can handle your affairs while you're alive. It doesn't affect anything after you're gone. But without it, no one has the right to, if you become incapacitated, right. pay your bills, deal with your insurance carrier, deal with your um, doctors. No one has the right to handle your affairs. You think if you're married right. that your spouse has a hall pass, right. or you think as a parent that you have the right to handle your affairs for your adult children. No. The day you turn 18, you are an, a whole individual right. by yourself, and no one has authority to help you. And if you don't have this document and something happens, we have to go to the court and get a guardianship set up. It's frightfully expensive. It's very invasive. And you can avoid that with a good dur general durable power of attorney. Well, and, and, and in this wonderful estate planning that we're talking about for seniors, all these different components, um, you know, some people feel... Uh, they're giving up, um, they're taking that one more step towards, you know, uh, the end of, of everything. Yes. And, uh, but there are checks and balances, are there not, for someone once they become a power of attorney, uh, have the power of attorney? Legally, they're not allowed to do anything that's not in your best interest. Okay. They're not allowed to do anything that you wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But without that document, the court will step in and appoint someone. It might not be the person you want to do it. It's so you, you are actually increasing your independence by giving up 
some control and adding someone to your life. That's wonderful. Say that again. I want, I want everyone watching to hear that. That's, that's a wonderful statement. I think that balances it out in our mind. You, you gain control and you maintain your independence by doing these documents in advance. Because if you don't have the documents on the day you become incapacitated, the only option is to go to the court right. and let the state of Florida pick for you. Right, absolutely. And I know we touched on too, as part of the estate planning, you know, uh, beyond the, the trust and, and the will, um, you know, there may be charities that are dear to your heart, or there may be organizations that are dear to your heart that if left up to someone else, uh, you know, they wouldn't benefit at all because in their mind, it's not the same as yours. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, so that would be another key thing that, uh, you know, if something's dear to your heart and you want to leave them something monetary or, or property, um, you should be able to make that call, which is another reason why you should have a will and a trust or in an estate. Am I correct? Some of the most meaningful planning I do is charitable planning. I mean, people are, it's near and dear to their heart. Right. They might have supported this church their entire life. Yes. And their loved ones, if they don't take action, might not think of it, might not know. Um, so if you want control, you have the choice to take control. And if you don't take action, you're just saying, okay, I'm going to let somebody else decide. Yeah, and, and I think this is a wonderful uh, rewire of our minds and yeah. how we should think about this. Because so many people do think of it as giving up control. You're actually gaining control. Gaining control. If we have people watching today and they're beginning to think, well, I need to do this. Uh, of course, going to someone who's an expert in it and helping you think through it is a key. But what should be one of the first one or two steps they're sitting in their living room that they need to think through so they're prepared to have that conversation with someone like you or someone with estate planning? Uh, whom would you trust to go to the doctor with you? Who knows what your feelings are about end of life care. Okay. Whom whom who balances their checkbook every month? Yeah. Who would not steal from you? Who do you trust to do this? If you have family members that'll do this wonderful. Not everybody does. Yeah. Um, you can hire out a lot of these things and generally advisors, good advisors hang out with other good advisors. Right. So if you have a good CPA, the good CPA will probably know a good estate planning attorney. Right. Or you have if you have a financial advisor, they're going to know a good CPA and a good like we ha we we travel in packs. Yes. <laughs> we travel in packs. So if you have if you surround yourself with good advisors and you let your adult children know that you've got advisors and let them know who the advisors are, your path into the elderly years is so much calmer and much less of a burden for your loved ones. Well, I, I think this information has, like I said, been invaluable just to rewire how we think about all of this. And I know it's changed my mind on some things, so this is great. And hopefully it's changed some of your minds or motivated you to get started. But we have more information, wonderful discussion. We're going to keep Merrill Bailey here, um, but we'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Welcome back to Join Our Town. I'm your host, Nick Kroger, and as promised, we've kept our wonderful guest, Meryl Bailey, here with us. And uh, we had a great discussion about wills and trusts and estate planning, essentially, in our first segment. But, uh, Meryl, I want to kind of stay within that same topic, but, but more focused on cognitive memory. And already some people are going, what? Um, and how it pertains to, you know, the decline of cognitive men memory uh, in, in our seasoned viewers, <laughs> our seniors. Um, first, let's start by you explaining what is cognitive memory decline and, and why is it important enough to talk about it? Cognitive memory decline is merely a reduction in your mental capability. And Okay, you know as we age, right. our hair might turn gray, we might can di dye it, but you, your hair turns gray, you get wrinkles, your eyesight isn't as good as it once right. was, it, it hurt, you know, your knees hurt, your back hurts. Yes. Well, 
it didn't occur to me until I heard a, a presentation by Professor Dan Marsden at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, who's doing really interesting research on cognitive decline for the National Endowment for Financial Education. And Dr. Marsden said that there's two different types of, of mental facility. Okay. There is your brain function, and at age 50, your brain function starts to drop like a rock. Oh. At age 50, I was shocked by that because at the time I heard that speech, I was 51. <laughs> and second, you have wisdom that you've accumulated over the years. So while your brain function starts to drop at age 50, you've got this wisdom you've accumulated over the years, and it so your decline isn't apparent yet. Okay. But eventually, as your age, your brain function drops so much that you forget your wisdom. Okay. And that's when cognitive decline becomes very apparent. And um, I know we're talking particularly about, you know, our senior friends. Um, let's just give a scenario, for instance, to help our viewers understand and maybe give them some insight on how to react. But let's say you're at home visiting your parents or your grandparents. Um, what are some signs or key signs of cognitive memory decline, you know, that you should look for, you know, because I'm sure there are some that you could mistake you know, for, yes. for decline. So help straighten that out for us. Well, a physician would tell you that if you would just look at the neurologist reports for your parents and look at the amyloid beta peptide list, you would know. But since I have no idea what those should <laughs> be, and most people don't share those right. results, I'll give you some more practical ex Thank experience. Thank you. Generally, if you don't live in the area and you only see your parents on holidays, when you go home for Christmas or you go home for Easter, and your mother, who has thrown Thanksgiving for 40 years flawlessly, stumbles, and the dinner doesn't get prepared properly. That's one of the earliest signs, because it shockingly uses an amazing amount of executive function to throw a big family dinner. Mm -hmm. You have to plan the menu. You have to drive to the store. You have to buy the food. You have to bring it home, put it away, follow a menu, get everything all ready. And so that's one of the earliest signs and that's one that hits home for me because I remember distinctly my mother who you know she was like the loaves and the fishes right she right. could feed 40 people out of the trunk of her car right. um, I'm one of seven children so big meals were a big thing I remember my brother and I looking at each other over at a Thanksgiving where everything was ready and my mother bent over to look at the turkey and she had forgotten to put the oven on uh -huh. and we looked at each other and realized that she couldn't pull it together anymore so that's one of the first things now if you go out to dinner with your dad to a restaurant, you see him more frequently, is he having trouble calculating the tip? Now be aware, because it might just be that it's dark and the right. type is small and he might not be able to see, but if it's a recurring thing, that's another early sign. When you're in their house, look to see the mail. Is the mail piling up? Are there unpaid bills? Are there demand notices that the bills are late? There could be, it could be a sign of several things. First, his vision might not be as well as it once was. He might not be able to comprehend that there are bills. He might not understand that it's a call to action because of cognitive decline. Um, he might have run out of money mm. and not told you. So that's another big thing. One of my favorites, go into the yard or go to the garage and walk around the car. Now, taking the car keys away is the topic for a whole other discussion. Right. No. <laughs> but yes. it, are there dents and bumps in the car be, that are unexplained? Um, he might be, again, losing his eyesight. He might be losing his mobility and not be able to turn and look where he's going. Or he might be cognitively declined enough to that he can't remember where he's going. He might not be able to judge distances. There's a whole bunch of things to look for. On the phone, if you're not, again, if you're not near your elders, pay attention to the people they name. Don't say, Mom, how you doing? Because she's always going to say, fine. Say, Mom, who did you see today? Mom, who is in your house okay. today? Ask very specific questions and you'll get a better answer. And if the same name pops up of someone you've not heard of before that's not part of your family circle, pay attention because the elders can get isolated. They can get lonesome. Right. And then they're subject to elder abuse. I see. I, I, I mean, it's fascinating. Those are wonderful practical tips. Um, and I, and I think that's really smart to, to, to check on those items that, you know, you've referenced. Let me ask you this. The cognitive decline, I know, I know you're not a medical doctor, yeah. but, you know, dealing with people, um, and, and especially with the estate planning we previously talked about, is this something, I know it's unique to each individual. Yes. But within a family, um, you know, 
because I know people that are 90 something, uh, you know, pushing 100 that are, their mind is, and they remember everything. And then you'll meet somebody 70, you know, or so, and, and their mind, you know, has declined. The cognitive memory has declined. Is there a family? I mean, I'm thinking hereditary is what I'm thinking. Okay. That, that, you know, oh, they lose their memory sooner, you know, on that line of the family that you've it, seen. It's very individual. Okay. And, but I hear all the time. I will tell clients, you know, they, they need to do documents. They need to do something. They take action. And they'll say, oh, my aunt sis, she was 93 and she was sharp as a tack. And I say, <laughs> you know what? Heidi Klum walks amongst us and we yes. don't all look like her either. Okay. So, you know, it's very Fantastic. Specific. And that's yeah. wonderful because, you know, a lot of people equate uh, cognitive memory decline and how you age or how quickly you go gray and yeah. you know as a family thing so that's a perfect example you know it is individual and we need to yes. pay attention uniquely to each person is even difference between mom or dad yes and uh, yes. Th that's always been very interesting to me um, what can advance adults let's say we have some seniors watching right now and they're saying well I want to be proactive, you know, I, I want to keep my mind sharp and, and can I train my brain to, to hold on longer and retain? Are there some practical um, things that, that a senior can do to aid in that? Well, all I can speak to is what can they do to make sure that they maintain their independence legally longer? Okay. And you have to take action. You have to go get documents mm -hmm. naming someone who can help you. Because you may be independent a very long time, but at some point you are going to need help. And if you didn't affirmatively get documents in advance, if you haven't worked with a lawyer to get an estate plan in advance, we have to go to the right. court to get permission to help you. So, and, and you know, how, as we're talking, I'm thinking, um, you know, we need to be very, pay very close attention to, to cognitive memory decline because that may force your hand to have that conversation, you know, as a family for what we talked about in the other segment to start taking some action. Um, what, in your experience, what is the best way to, to start that kind of a conversation? I mean, to me, that's half a dozen of one this way, that way, and it could go anyway. Uh, what are your suggestions? Oh, golly. It's such a... It can be such a difficult topic. Yes, you know? absolutely. And, and I come from a family where everyone discussed everything all the time. Me too. So we started early, <laughs> we started young. It, there was nothing that you couldn't discuss right. at the dinner table. Not everyone's fa is, family is like that. My husband's family is so polite. Right. <laughs> they they right. don't discuss anything, it's according <laughs> to me. Um, so I would say start the conversation as early as you can. Putting it off is never going to help. But you have to be very respectful because you're talking to people about the fact that they're going to lose their independence. They're very prideful. They want, they don't necessarily want to tell you how much they're worth. They don't want to tell you. These are very difficult things. But if you say, mom, I know you love me. I know you don't want to make things difficult in the future. I love you. I want to help you. Have you done these documents? What's the name of your advisors. Uh, who's your lawyer? Who's your financial planner? Who's your CPA? You know, one of the biggest issues that's coming up right now is digital assets. It used to be when someone would call me and say, my mom had a stroke and I, I don't know what to do to help her, uh, or my mom has died, I don't know what to do. And I would say, go to her house, pick up all the mail, find her tax returns, get her checkbook, get her address book, get her calendar, we can figure everything out. Well, right. now you carry, everyone does their right. calendar and their address book are on the phone yes. and their tax returns are being filed electronically. And you think because you watch a TV show that you can, that, you know, Timmy can find out your password in 30 seconds yes. or less, you, it's almost impossible to do. So you have to share that information. Right. And it's important, you know, talking about, you know, memory decline, to do that sooner than later while you have someone that can share the accurate information to help making this planning better once it comes to that. Yes. And I think, um, I, I just think this has been a wonderful topic and, uh, um, you know, especially with the cognitive memory decline, we were talking before we went to air about, you know, um, having wonderful life experiences and have you shared those with your family, you know, and before they're gone, you know, and, and, and I would encourage, and I think you would too, based on your experience with people, you know, before that cognitive memory decline comes, there's wonderful stories that pertain to your family or your history of your people. I mean, that's something to encourage 
the young people to do with their parent or grandparent. Yes, one of, one of the greatest legacies you can leave are your memories. Yes. More, even sometimes more than money. Uh, my father was General Eisenhower's bodyguard and driver in World War Get II. Out. all right. And he had the most wonderful stories. His high school class was drafted and, and away he went to war. And a college student from Rollins helped him write his memoirs. And that is so precious to us. Yes. And we, at the time, we were like, oh my gosh, if I have to listen to that story one more time, I'm gonna, <laughs> just go, I'm gonna cry in the corner. And now it is just the most meaningful thing that we have left of my dad. And I am kind of in that same situation um, with a family member and, and they have, again, with the, the memoirs and putting the stories together. And it, it's even great, they're still here, you know, to discuss them, to yes. further find insight um, now. And I think that's what I'm getting talking with you today. You know, action should be now and, and, and um, putting together stuff while you're still, you know, feel in charge and can make those decisions. Now is a good time to start. Now, that. now is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so now seems to be the key word on both of these. Better than later, yes, now. <laughs> yeah, and what would you say, you know, what would you say to, to um, someone who is watching today and, and they feel as if, um, well, they're kind of in denial. My mother's never going to, do, you know, my mother's yes. uh, in the history of her sisters and her mother, they, they, their memory was fine up until the very end. How would you convince them to take that step over that one last hurdle of being uncomfortable or insinuating you're about to go, you know, which is I know a fear a child has especially. What, what would you say to them that would just encourage them? Generally, I found that people think they're going to be healthy longer than they are going to be. Right. They think they're going to have more money than they actually have. And they think their family is going to step up and cheerfully, cooperatively help. <laughs> and that doesn't always happen right. without a lot of drama. So if you want to not be a burden, you have to take action now. And most people don't want to be a burden. Yeah. That, that, I think that's a wonderful viewpoint. Meryl, thank you so much for being here. This has been wonderfully uh, informative and uh, I can't thank you enough. I think it helped a lot of our viewers as well. Terrific. I've been so glad to be here. Thank you, Nick. And viewers, I hope you've gained a teeny bit even of this wonderful uh, bit of information that we shared today, quite a bit. And I hope you are encouraged and motivated to take action now, whether you uh, have an adult uh, senior parent or whether that's you. Um, you don't want to be a burden to your family, so make the arrangements now so everything is handled the way you want. And remember, if we do all this together, we can spread a little bit of joy in our town. We'll see you again real soon. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep joy in our town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.